Okay, uh, welcome back. So I hope you guys had a decent last week, right? Yeah. Any questions? I mean, I got one question here about this forward transmission, reverse transmission. Any other questions? Any questions regarding uh, whatever we had covered till last month? Any conceptual questions? Yes. Sir, in the plot that we did between I2 and uh, V1, uh, we uh, did that uh, uh, the constant here. I2 will shoot up to infinite, right? Yeah, I and mean, that's the expectation. Yes. The reason for I2 shooting infinite is Y2 uh, uh Yeah, so it's it's the other way around. So essentially, if we were trying, okay, let me recap, then probably we'll explain. Right? So uh, we are meeting after almost a week's back. So let me give you a quick uh, five minute recap of what we were doing. Uh, so somewhere in, in one of the lectures, we I tried to convince you that you require nonlinearity to get amplification, to get power amplification. So and then we also agreed on the fact that we cannot handle nonlinear networks as is. So we need a framework to handle nonlinear networks. And the framework for handling nonlinear networks is essentially perturbation, right? You you perturb your uh, uh, you perturb the system parameters. By a small amount, then it is expected that whatever uh, whatever voltage or current that you are looking at will also get put out by a small amount. But the 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 relationship between the perturbation that you applied at the input or anywhere in the network with the uh, output perturbation will be linear. That essentially was the crux of what we were doing. And we also saw that if you have any generic nonlinear network, the 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 ratio of the perturbation of the voltage to perturbation of the current across that network is equivalent to equivalent to a small signal impedance of the of that of that uh, nonlinear element. So in essence, we can replace any nonlinear element with the with the uh, perturbation equivalent, which in this case is an impedance del v by del i. So if that is the case, then it becomes simpler because we know how to how to handle linear networks. So in the presence of nonlinearity. Then we resorted to saying that all our inputs will be small signal. What is small obviously depends on how much error you can tolerate, because ultimately when you are dealing with perturbation and you are trying to develop a linear relationship between the perturbed input and the perturbed output, you are obviously making assumption of neglecting the higher order terms of the Taylor series. And when you neglect some terms, obviously you are incurring error. But how much error is tolerable obviously is dependent upon how much uh, what is the particular application. So in this course, we are not bothered about what happens if you if you uh, neglect those errors. We will just concentrate on the fact that, that whatever we will be doing, the errors will be negligible, and we will go through go ahead with uh, dealing with uh, this part of inputs and outputs. And uh, since the framework of a uh, of, of of a nonlinear network suits i mean since our framework suits very well to to the signals and to the, to the signals that we want to deal with for example we use sinusoidal signals we use sig signals from sensors uh, the mobile phones that you use you touch the screen so you are touching and changing some you are perturbing the screen in some way as it turns out there are there are resistive sensors and capacitive sensors on a cell phone so if you touch the cell phone it changes the capacitance by a small amount when you touch it, the capacitance changes by a small amount, the charge changes by a small amount. Obviously, it generates a, uh, generates a, a current which changes by a small amount. So there is a linear, linear relationship between the force that you are applying on the cell phone screen and the current that is getting generated. But the but the absolute relationship is nonlinear because you have a linear relationship. There is a certain amount of prediction. Predict. I mean, you expect a predict uh, predictive output when you are touching the cell phone screen. With the force that you are applying. You expect the screen to move in a certain way, in a linear way. So it these all of these uh, uh, all of these uh, concepts have real life applications that we use in a day to day life. Then we said that uh, okay, fine. So this is a framework of dealing with nonlinear elements, a nonlinear network. But then what do you do? Well, we, so far so good. But how do we make an amplifier using those concepts? Uh, we also showed that we require a two port network. 
uh, to, to uh, we didn't show that, but we we uh, uh, we started off assuming that we have a two port network. You have an input, you have an output, so minimum you require a two port network. So uh, if we have to uh, now, <coughs> so if we now we'll have to get an amplification out of a two port network. That is, you you apply an input and apply an output, and you have a nonlinear element inside the network, which means you'll have to replace that nonlinear element with that perturbation equivalent, which in other words, in this course, we are calling the small signal equivalent, which means essentially the differential of that del i del v curve, right? Uh, so when you replace them, then you again come back to uh, come back to linear domain, and then you do an analysis of the linear incremental domain. So that essentially has been uh, what we have been doing from the network side. Then we, we said that there are certain properties uh, uh, there are certain expected properties of this two port network which requires us, uh, which are essential for us, uh, rather, which is, which is absolutely essential to get power amplification. And what were those properties? Those properties were essentially. Uh, so, again, if this is I. This is I1. This is. Nonlinear two port. We had relationship of I one and I two with respect to V one and V two. But obviously, this is of not much use as far as analysis is concerned. Then we said that if we, I mean, we we uh, all the signals of interest are varying in time or varying in amplitude. So essentially, we'll be having some input. And this is Vi, this is V naught. We wanted to see what is the what is the expected y parameter? What is the expected y parameter model of this two-port network? Which will give us amplification, and from the uh, so so the reason we uh, now coming back to your question, uh, so reason we want to do want to figure out what is the expected y parameter is because then it will help us to choose a device of our choice which can do this job. So you, it's not as if you pick any device it will give you power amplification. You need a particular device which needs to have a certain type of IV characteristics which can give us power amplification. So we are essentially looking out for that particular device. Now, when you are looking out for a such, I mean, consider yourself to be a detective. What do you do? You look at what you need, what you are expecting, and then you try and see which device is around or what, uh, what from the clues that you get from here, what device that you know of that gives you those, those IV characteristics. Now, how, how do I get IV characteristics from this? So if I know what Y11, Y12, Y21, Y22 look like, or expected that is what in ideal condition what I expect them to be, then I will use that information to figure out which device gives us such an IV characteristics. And why these Y parameters are differentials of my IV characteristics. It's certain differentials, differentials with respect to one port or say the port at which you are applying the input, or maybe some other port that is a transport. So so, so because of these, uh, so as long as we know the differentials. We can integrate it and figure out what will be the total IV characteristics. That's essentially what we were after. And then we, we, we said that uh, this Y parameter uh, matrix obviously uh, can be represented as, uh, in a circuit parlance, can be represented as so these are all in small signal domain. So uh, we 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 went we derived v two over v one and uh, under I mean in in the case that we saw we derived uh, with respect to when we had an incremental input with a source resistance but uh, nonetheless uh, so we, what we saw that your this ratio of
ratio of V2 over Vs will be maximum. When? Now help me out. When will this be maximum? Yeah. So, so starting from the input side, we would want Y11 to be zero. zero, right? Why do I want Y11 to be zero? Because we don't want any. We don't want any voltage difference to appear across V1. I want the entire Vs to appear across V1. So I want Y11 to be zero. So if Y11 to be zero, it, it becomes, I mean, this essentially vanishes. Also, we wanted Y12 to be zero. Okay, before we go to Y12 to be zero, there was a question that, uh, I mean, uh, to go, over, go through this concept again, that why do you want Y21 to be infinity and Y12 to be zero? So uh, let me throw the question back to you. So why do you, um, which, among these y12 and y21 parameters, which can, uh, which one do you think is giving you forward propagation of the signal? Ultimately, we want signal to pro go from port one to port two, right? So, firstly, if we don't have either of them, there is, I mean, no signal can go because these y12 and y21 are the information, are the small signal equivalents or the control sources that are helping the signal to propagate from port one to port two or port two to port one. Right, so these are the trans parameters, right? So if you don't have these trans parameters, the signal will not go from one port to other port of a two port network. So as long as that is fine, then we have to see which of these parameters are of our interest. We want the signal to go from port one to port two and not the other way around in order to get amplification, at least in this context. So which means that your Y21 needs to be high. If you want gain, you want Y21 to be high, right? It, we, do we agree on that? Okay, so if we want Y21 to be high and if we want as large gain as possible, we want Y21 to be as high as possible, right? One follows the other. However, we don't want any back propagation from Y, I mean, uncontrolled back propagation from output to input, simply because it, it, it can so turn out to be that if you have, so one signal is going this way, if you have Y12, then there will be some feedback coming from output to input. So now, it can, under certain condition, I haven't, I mean, I didn't show this intuitively, but uh, we showed this with maths to some extent that under certain condition, if this is satisfied, then this loop will get, become self-sustainable. When this loop becoming self-sustainable is not such a good thing because it, uh, it essentially is telling you that even if you remove the input, nothing will happen, you'll get some output. And this helps, I mean, this is, this is implied by the, when, you, when we did V0 over Vs, we got certain condition where you can cancel the denominator and you can get infinite gain, right? So infinite gain is equivalent to saying that even if you have zero input, you can have some finite output, right? Depending on certain conditions, you can get, even if the input tends to zero, you can get output to be equal to some finite value. Now, if that is the case, which means that this is not serving our purpose for an amplifier. You can as well remove the input, but you are getting an output. Now, what in output you are getting depends on how these parameters Y12, Y21, Y11, Y22 are. That has nothing to do with the input. It has everything to do with the device that you are, that you are using. So that is something we would want to avoid because ultimately we want control. We want control over the signal that we are trying to process. If we don't have any control and the device is doing its own thing, that doesn't serve our purpose. So that is why we would like to get away with the if there is any internal feedback mechanism, internal feedback aspects to the device that you are using, which essentially means that let's say you have five, six devices to choose from, and you find out that Y12 is quite high, Y21 is also very high, then you have to be slightly cautious that under certain conditions, there, it can as well be that because of this feedback, net, feedback mechanism, the, de the device can become self-sustainable and you can get some output with respect to input. Now, then you have to think whether should I use that device to make an amplifier or not. Now that that becomes a question of what are the other uh, stuff that are connected around the device. Uh, you had a question. Yes, sir. So in order to prevent the back transmission from Y21 to Y12, uh, we need to tune down the value of Y12, right? Right, right. Uh, sir, but uh, uh, for the transmission of I1 from port 1 to port 2, we need Y1 to be uh, some, uh, to have some significant value. Right? You want Y21 to be significant, not Y12, right? You don't want a Y21 is only Y12 is relating port 2 to port 1. Okay. So that we don't want. Right. So the example that I showed was if I go very close to the loudspeaker, 
you, you get oscillation, right? So why do you get oscillation? As I go close to the loudspeaker, the loudspeaker essentially is, is throwing, away, throwing out uh, uh, sound waves and, and, the, uh, and the intensity of the sound waves essentially varies by one over R squared, right? I mean, it's a way, of, if the farther you are from the loudspeaker, the less intense you are intercepting. And the sound that you are intercepting is lesser and lesser in intensity. So essentially, whatever it's, we have some Y12 from the loudspeaker to my, set, to my uh, speaker, but the amount of signal that I'm intercepting is very small. But if I go closer and closer, right? So I can say that I'm changing my quiescent point and overall I'm intercepting a larger amount of signal, which means that this feedback network from second port two to port one is, is gaining in strength. So under certain particular condition, if I go very, particularly close, I mean, very close to the uh, to the loudspeaker, you will see this becomes self-sustainable. And uh, even if I don't speak, it will make noise, right? So that's what I demonstrated. And that essentially was, was one, one way to, uh, to show that what happens if, if you have unwanted feedback. Now, obviously we want to make circuits later on with desired feedback, we'll be putting feedback in, uh, uh, in, your, in our networks, but we'll be controlling them in such a way that it doesn't create oscillation. But you don't want oscillation to happen because of the creation of the device itself. So that is why you don't want Y12 to be of any significant value. Yes. Okay, so uh, so why don't you tell me what is bothering me, then I will take it from there. Ah, okay, so, so control term is, is essentially, I mean, if I go back to that expression, right? This is V0 over Vs you had something on the denominator and you had in the num uh, uh, numerator and denominator, you had something like Y11 plus GS, Y22 plus GL, right? So now you had something here. So now, <laughs> so all these parameters, Y11, Y22, Y1, Y, these are essentially differentials of the IV characteristics of the device. Right now, as it so turns out, the IV characteristics of the device is controllable to some extent, but but not to a very accurate extent because uh, your IV characteristics of the device depends on temperature. If you change the temperature, your IV, and for example, even resistance changes with temperature. Right, so obviously, semiconductor devices will also change their IV characteristics with temperature. If IV characteristics changes with temperature, means all these differentials will change. Similarly, if you change the ambient condition, right? For example, you see that many of the device characteristics also are dependent on uh, the, their quiescent operating point, right? So if you change the voltage across them, if you change the current through them, their IV characteristics might change. Or even you might move at in the different portion of the curve of the IV characteristics because you have changed the quiescent point. No, no, it can change. It changes the device characteristics. We'll see later. We'll see later. There are some. I mean, it changes. Actually, changes the device characteristics depends on depending upon what type of uh, uh, voltage and currents that you apply. And even if, even if we don't go there, it it will. I mean, this is easy to see that you will be moving at a different part of the IV cap, right? Now, if you move to the different part of the IV cap, there is no guarantee that all these tangents will remain the same. In fact, they don't. Right, so essentially, all these y one, all these y y parameters will change <laughs> depending upon how what are the how you have set up the circuit. Right now, you have set up the circuit in a certain way. Your temperature changed. You, you can go from zero degree to forty degree or minus forty degree depending upon where you are on the planet. Right, so all, if when all of these changes, these are totally not in your control. Right, so then you might say that I will I will. Uh, for example, I I um, one, one I mean I was expecting this question from uh, someone that I mean I do, I want to max minimize this, but I don't, don't want to set it to zero. I'll set it to a small value. 0 0.1, 0 0.01. It's possible, right? Mathematically, it's possible. But what happens if we do that? If these guy y parameters change, then that 0.1 or 0 0.01 might vanish to become zero, and it can go to infinity. Right, so I mean, the, this V zero over V S can go to infinity, and it might cause uh, cause you trouble essentially. So you don't want to rely when you are design designing anything. Not only circuit, any design is about control. You would want to control your system accurately and with fair amount of certainty. So you don't want to rely on things which are not in your control to a large extent. So device um, characteristics are not particularly in your control. For a circuit designer, is totally not in your control. Because the device engineer has given you a certain device, 
you are working with its IV care. Now, you probably know that this IV care varies with some extent with temperature and bias and all those things. But since it is particularly not in your control, you would like to do away with this. You know you can control resistance capacitance, you can put them wherever you want. So you deal with that. So essentially, that's what I want uh, going at. That you ultimately will see, you, you cannot do away with feedback. You will require feedback to design good circuits. But uh, if, you are, if you are putting elements in feedback which are fully in your control in certain way, then you can deal away with these oscillations type of, type of things. But if you are putting things in feedback which are not in your control, then things like this can happen where the remainder are unwanted till you go to zero. Right. So that's essentially the philosophy of it. So again, I mean, I understand that I haven't been, I, I, I am trying to do a, a hand wavy job here because a lot of things here has to go back and forth, right? So you are doing 250. You will see some of these things in 250, but I will also deal with this instability stuff later on in the course. But if I put instability, a rigorous analysis now, I'll essentially lose you. So I don't want to do that. So, so it's baby steps, right? Okay, fine. <clears throat> Uh, so then we did all these things, and then we said that uh, 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 if y11 goes to zero, y12 goes to zero, so input port is essentially open, right? So and the output port, uh, we knew that, I mean, we concluded that y21 should be infinity, so or very high, and we also concluded that y22 has to be zero because we want, we don't want. Uh, uh, I mean, the current that I am getting from y21 v1 should entirely go into RL and not into y22 so we said that this essentially this is my expect ideal this is the this is what we are looking for this is the ideal uh, the stuff within the box is essentially my ideal two port incremental two port network with only one voltage control current source in the incremental sense this is the ideal this is the expected uh, this is the expected device if we can get one but no surprises for guessing that we don't have a device which does all of these together. All of, I mean, satisfies all of our requirement. But there are devices which we can get get close enough. So we we'll look into those devices. We we'll look into those devices from here on. And as it turns out, MOSFET is one device which gets gets us pretty close to what we want. And that will be the point of discussion for from here on. Okay. Even even you guys have uh, done IV, uh, IV characteristics of BJTs in ESC two zero one, I presume. BJT is one cell device which uh, which also gets us pretty close to what we want. But since MOSFET is something that is ubiquitously used in the industry, right? So it, you, I mean, more than ninety nine percent of the transistors that you see in the industry are MOSFETs. So we like to concentrate more on the MOSFETs uh, in this course, and we'll uh, get to BJTs later on. I mean, uh, in the fag end of this course, we'll draw some parallel between BJT and MOSFET and move ahead. Okay, fine. Uh, also, we uh, in, in the last class, I gave a very elementary dis uh, introduction to device uh, uh, semiconductor devices, and we looked into uh, PN junction. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, I forgot to mention this. Some one of you asked me after the class that is VBI the built-in potential of a PN junction. If we recall, the built-in potential of a PN junction is it equal to the cutting voltage of the PN junction? What do you think? What do you mean by cutting voltage of a PN junction? Pardon? Right, right. So, so the definition of cutting voltage that we uh, that we have learned in ESC two zero one or even before that was the fact that you apply certain voltage and before that voltage there is no current. After that voltage you have certain lot of current, right? But now we know that there is no such thing as at its cutting voltage in a diode, right? So it's basically a a mental model or a, a, a model that we use to make our life easy. Because your diet followed by diet characteristics, characteristics is exponential. It's nowhere it says that beyond something, it will be current will go to zero. After something, it will be very high. It's always exponential. But if you, because of the fact that exponential rises very fast, right, with respect to uh, the independent, uh, independent parameter, we say that. Uh, if we are operating within certain range of currents, let's say a millimeter to two millimeter or millimeter to 10 millimeter, not millimeter, milliamps, right? So if you are, uh, if you are operating in a certain range of currents of let's say milliamps to 10 milliamps or something, then because of this exponential nature, I can assume that the diode voltage, forward bias voltage hasn't really changed, right? It's a very strong nonlinearity. So we, do, we assume that the diode voltage hasn't changed. So then we say that if you are operating at that particular voltage, in that particular current rate, the voltage across the diode is pinned to some value, 
it hasn't changed. And that essentially we call it as a cartoon 13 voltage. So it's a theoretical construct that we are used to make our circuit, uh, circuit design easier. It's not a fundamental property of a diode. So built-in voltage of a diode has nothing to do with the cutting voltage of the diode. If it, if it appeared to be so from my last lecture, then I apologize, it's not meant to be that. Okay, uh, uh, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's now proceed with uh, the content of this lecture. Uh, so now that I've been, uh, I've been told that uh, even in the last class, uh, it appeared that you guys are comfortable with, 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 uh, with the fact that there is some amount of doping in a, uh, in a semiconductor and depending on the type of doping, you can make it whole dominant or electron dominant, right? So in one case, we call it a P-type semiconductor if it's whole dominant, mm -hmm. and we call it an N-type semiconductor if it's a electron dominant semiconductor, right? So as it turns out, uh, in the in, uh, in, in when you will be learning semiconductor devices, you will see that most of the devices that we use are have a, uh, it starts from a piece of silicon. It starts from a piece of silicon, which is initially doped with P-type, right? It, it's initially doped with P-type. So let's say I took a piece of silicon and did a cross-section of it. I'm looking at a cross-section of it, and you can assume that this is a P-type semiconductor. And we call it generally P minus because it's minus and plus are used uh, to, 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 say, uh, to, to indicate whether it is lightly doped or heavily doped. Again, these are again terminologies. You don't have to bother about it. But uh, if I use P minus, don't think that it is something really different. It's essentially to do with the concentration of the do doping of uh, holes and electrons that you have used, right? So generally, you're uh, in an intrinsic silicon, the doping concent I mean, the free, free electron concentration is of the order of 10 power 10 per cubic centimeter. In case of, uh, if you dope it more than 10 power 10 per cubic centimeter, obviously it will become either P or N type. But uh, now depending upon how much you dope it by, if you dope it by, let's say 10 power, you can dope it by 10 power 15 acceptor ions, you can dope it by 10 power 17 acceptor ions, 10 power 19 acceptor ions, and so on. So depending upon where you are in that range, it's sometimes called lightly or weakly doped or, or heavily doped. So uh, P minus, essentially, I'm, I am, uh, what I am trying to convey here is that P minus means you have a weakly doped P-type semiconductor. So now uh, let's assume that somebody has come up and said that I'll put a insulator on on top of it okay i put some insulator on top so this is an insulator and on top of this i'll i'll put another metal layer this is metal so there are some again some terminologies which are used to denote this metal insulator uh, and and this p minus so, so this piece of silicon that you started with, with uh, which was lightly doped with P minus, this is called the body or bulk. Okay, or bulk. The metal that you see on top, it's called the gate. And the insulator that you that you see, it's generally, I mean, it's not, uh, it, uh, the purpose of this insulator is essentially to make a capacitor between two plates. I mean, whenever you see an insulator you, and you have a metal on top, you should assume that something underneath is also probably also acting as some, I mean, the purpose of this is probably electrically is to give you some capacitance. We'll see how it gives, but uh, this, this insulator is often, is, I mean, almost always made up of some sort of oxide. So essentially you, you oxidize the silicon and you get some SiO2. You get silicon dioxide and silicon dioxide as it turns out is very good insulator for the purpose of making, making semiconductor devices. So, so this is what we call an oxide. Okay. Uh, by the way, this body is all, is called bulk. It's also called substrate. Okay. So now, because you see, you have a metal on top, you have oxide in the middle, and you have a substrate on on uh, underneath. That is why this structure is called MOS structure, right? So this is called M O 
Yes. So the MOS essentially means that metal oxides uh, and uh, substrate. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, <coughs> so this is what the initial MOS, MOS structure used to look like. Now it has got, I mean, the, uh, the contents of this have changed over the years. Instead of metal, we use different variants of uh, materials. Often we use polysilicon. This is the amorphous version of a silicon which has fairly high conductivity. And why we use that is, uh, is, is a part of, I mean, how easy to, how easy is it to make these structures? What are the thermal, uh, what are the conductivity properties of, of these materials? Those are something that you will learn later on in device related courses, but it doesn't matter for, 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 for this course, it doesn't matter whether you have metal or if you have uh, silicon dioxide or gallium nitrate, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it essentially, what we'll, we, what, what we'll deal with is the fact that we'll have an MOS structure and we'll give you the properties of the MOS structure to deal with, right? We don't, we'll not get into why uh, so, uh, why we have used to certain metal or not something else. So we'll give you the structure of MOS and we'll deal with that. So now uh, let's assume that uh, you have connected a battery. You have connected a battery between the day and the body. Okay. So you have connected a battery between the gate and the body, and I call it BGB. Gate and body, BGB. Okay. So when uh, 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 let's assume that you have started from zero and you are trying to increase the battery voltage. Okay. So so when you are trying to increase the battery voltage, what will happen? You will have a electric field. Going from the metal to the through the oxide into the body. Okay. So now uh, going back to the fact that you know that you have holes in this P type semi P type body. What do you think is going to happen to the holes that are near the uh, near the junction of uh, body and oxide? No, recombination is a is a thermal phenomena which keeps on happening regardless whether you have a voltage or not, right? So uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that after you apply the VGB, what do you think will happen to the holes which are <laughs> around? So they move downward. Yeah. So you are pushing the mobile holes downward, right? It it's too you are pushing you are giving an electric field, so it will go towards the direction of the electric field and it will move downward. So whatever holes were here. So you had holes everywhere. You, but you also had immobile ions, right? How did you get holes? You get holes by doping it with acceptor ions, right? Trivalent impurities. So, so those impurities, the underlying ions are not mobile. So you have We call it A because it's called acceptor. So you have immobile acceptor ions everywhere. And you have holes also of equal concentration everywhere. Now, when you apply it in electric field, when you apply it in electric field, these holes will desert that section and it will go away. Right? So because you have pushed the holes away, so these holes will move away. And you will be only be left with this acceptor ions, Na minus immobile acceptor ions, which cannot run away around that junction. So essentially, what will start to happen is around this junction, you will you will gather these Na minus charges. Okay. So uh, now it uh, it should be intuitive that when, if I keep on increasing this VGB. So this, this area where we have only Na minus charges, that is the depletion region. This is equivalent to the depletion region in a PN junction. So this depletion region will expand in which, right? Because you have to give, uh, uh, yeah, you have to accommodate for the fact that the electrical lines of force that are generating from the metal has to terminate into the semiconductor. So which means that if you have certain amount of charge on the metal, you have to have equal amount of charge in the semiconductor also, right? Otherwise, the uh, lines of force will not terminate. Okay, so in order to terminate the lines of forces, which means that 
uh, we, you will have to have more and more of this Na minus in within this repletion region that you have accumulated. Okay, so which means that your your uh, the depletion region bit will keep on increasing. So this depletion region will keep on increasing as you keep on increasing the VGB. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. So now, uh, so then one might question that, hey, if I keep on increasing VGB, then does it mean that the depletion region will keep on increasing and go to the bottom of this? I mean, will, will encompass the entire semiconductor? One might argue that, but as it turns out, uh, there is an, another uh, uh, another process that is going on in the background, as he alluded to a few minutes back, that there is a generation recombination process which keeps on happening throughout the semiconductor, regardless of whether you have applied electric field, you have done something or not. That's a, as long as you have you are away from zero Kelvin, there is a there is generation or uh, generation of electrons and recombination of electron hole pairs and recombination of electron hole pairs that happening throughout the semiconductor, which means that there are elect, I, let me remove these Na minus. We we'll assume that these Na minus are, are there, but note that you, you are having these electrons and holes getting generated everywhere in the semiconductor. Okay. So now, now assume that these electrons and holes are getting generated in this depletion region. So in this, within this depletion region, electrons and holes are getting generated. Now, in the presence of electric field, what do you think will happen to the electrons and what will do you think will happen to the holes? The holes will get pushed out. The holes will get pushed out and the electrons will get pulled, mm -hmm. right? So the elect so essentially what will happen slowly, you will be gathering electrons near this surface. Yeah. So now note that this, you have an insulator in between. You have an insulator between the uh, oxide, between the metal and the semiconductor. They are not directly connected because they are not directly connected. It cannot punch through, right? So since it cannot punch through, uh, as it turns out, in some of the modern devices, they indeed punch through. That is called tunneling. But I mean, we will steer clear of that as of now. So so let's assume they don't punch through. If they don't punch through. Uh, then with increasing VGB, you will start gathering more and more mobile electrons, right? These are mobile carriers. These are not immobile ions. You are starting to gather more and more mobile carriers, uh, almost flush along with this oxide semiconductor interface. So you are gathering more and more mobile carriers here. Okay. Now one might argue that, hey, why aren't these electrons and the holes that are getting generated recombine, also recombine off? Because thermal recombination and generation are ubiquitous. It happens everywhere. right? So what is so special around the surface? Everywhere is getting generated and recombine, uh, and they are also recombining with each other. Why aren't they recombining here? That's a fair enough question to ask. And the answer to that is the fact that so, so this recombination doesn't take place immediately. There is a th something called a recombination lifetime. Which essentially means that uh, if you these electrons and the holes have to hang out, hang around with each other for some amount of time before they recombine. So this recombination life, lifetime is also a function of what type of device you are using. In some devices they are quite high, some devices they are quite small. But regardless of the fact that it's not zero. So on on a statistical basis, there is a thermal generation rate that is at what rate at per second how many electron hole pairs you generate, and at what rate how many of these recombine with each other. And under thermal, thermal equilibrium, they are equal to each other. That's why you, it neither increases nor decreases. Okay, so now, now consider the situation where these electron hole pairs are getting generated, but as soon as they are getting generated, you are both of them are seeing electric field. And since they are get, seeing electric field, they are getting pulled apart. So they are not get, get, getting the time to hang around each other, so they are not recombining. So since they are not recombining, you are, you are getting an excess amount of mobile electrons around the interface and not anywhere else, right? Where you don't have electric field, they are still, they are still operating under the condition of thermal equilibrium. <laughs> and you, I mean, you are still not getting an excess electron or excess hole, but you are getting excess electron around this interface because there is an electric field that is pulling them apart. Okay, so now 
what what keeps on happening is that if you keep on increasing the gcb now okay so let me take a step back so note that now if this this mobile electrons also start gathering then this electrical lines of force that is starting from the metal and terminating into the oxide is seeing a termination on these electrons electron sheet kind of that is that that is getting formed right it's no longer is uh, it's no longer required for the depletion region to increase in order to see in order to terminate the lines of forces right so we started off with what we started off saying that you have these acceptor ions which are providing which are providing a way to uh, providing a uh, uh, a sink for this for these electrical lines of forces to terminate and because you are increasing the electric field this sink has to increase otherwise they cannot terminate but now we are say, seeing that because we are get, we, we we are able because of the thermal process we are able to generate this mobile electrons this another sink is getting generated which is closer to the surface since we are generating another sink for this electric field so it's no longer required for uh, after certain critical voltage is no longer required to uh, for this depletion region to increase in order to accommodate all the electrical lines of forces okay so as it turns out as it turns out uh, oh n minus is the acceptor ion that's the mobile right so you let's say you had doped with boron right so boron accepted an ion and sat there accepted an electron and sat there it became b minus and the hole is free to move. The B minus isn't free to move. When we apply the electric field, that N minus, the G minus plus N minus goes away and goes to the top. No, 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 no. The N, mi N minus sits there. N minus it cannot move. But it had an electron, right? So this, okay. So you are saying that how, how are these electron hole pairs getting generated? Is that the question? Not necessarily. It can come from the underlying silicon also. Let's say you have an undock piece of, undock piece of silicon. It also generates plus and minus holes all the time, and they also recom recombine off, right? So as long as you have P, P plus semiconductor, it will get generated. Now, whether it generates from uh, Na minus or Ni or, or the underlying silicon is immaterial, right? So the, uh, the concept that I would like to emphasize is that because of thermal, because of temperature, there is always generation of electrons and holes. Okay, but yes. Since electrons are the minority character, at what point of time would it all be that only holes will be left? Right. So what, what he's pointing out is that I mean when you when you say all three you keep on doping, when you keep on doping, they all uh, you, you you can essentially uh, engulf all the uh, electrons and only with the holes. So as it turns out, it, it doesn't really happen because all these uh, approximations that we are doing is under a condition called uh, lightly dope or you, you don't essentially dope it in such a way that all of so okay so so, so if you recall uh, when we did this pn junction and doping and all those things what i said is that you have silicon 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 everywhere and maybe one of them got knocked off and it became boron so the assumption that i made was it's not as if all the boron everywhere in all the silicon gets replaced by boron Right, so the if, uh, if, I mean, you need an environment of silicon for it to delete for the boron to capture an electron. If the environment changes, then this assumption that we are making will not be valid. So, so this we are again assuming a hundred percent ionization, right? Because we are assuming that each boron is contributing to one hole. So that happens only when the environment of a boron is silicon. If the environment changes, this assumption goes away. Right. So, so what you are saying might be true if you extend this model, but you cannot extend this model beyond uh, certain limits because then the environment changes. You have to take into other things into account. Yes. No, no, they will not get right acceptor ions. They are already <coughs> their ions, right? Why did the acceptor ions get formed in the first place? They were unionized initially. They had an they were unionized initially, and they got an electron and became acceptor ions. 
Now, when they have become an accepted ion, we cannot accept another electron. <laughs> Isn't it? That Na minus, in this case, N minus, cannot accept, uh, accept another electron. So even if it's sitting there, it, 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 it's kind of sitting like a dead duck, right? It cannot do anything. So now if there is a background E minus uh, electron hole pair that has get, that is getting generated, the, the holes will go away because you have a, you are generating these electron hole pairs under the influence of, I mean, under the influence of an electric field. So the holes go away and the electrons then stay back. Right, so that's all that is happening. Now you are generating an additional. So the total negative charge in the semiconductor was initially only being contributed by the accepted ions. Now the total negative charge is being contributed by accepted ions plus mobile electrons. Right, so now as you keep on increasing the electric field, is more, more you get, you tend to have more and more of these mobile electrons, and so that is why the need for these accepted ions to increase is not there anymore. Because these mobile electrons are hogging the line like that, they are almost at the sheet. They are terminating most of the electric field. So no more electric field are getting, are penetrating into the semiconductor interface. So that is why after certain critical voltage, right, or threshold voltage, you don't get any more. Uh, you, you, I mean, what you get essentially is only influence of the mobile electrons. So if you, after certain threshold voltage, if you increase the voltage by another delta V, you will see a total increase in charge in the semiconductor, but that increase in charge will be solely due to increase of the mobile electrons, not due to Na minus. Correct. Right. So that essentially is is a is what uh, uh, what gives us what we want because what uh, we are after is is we are after carrier transport. Right, you have to. You are interested. We are interested in currents and voltages. In particular, in this case, currents. In order to get currents, you need mobile carriers. We are interested in mobile electrons and holes. We are not particularly interested as circuit designers in what happens to the ionized impurities which cannot move. We are interested in mobile electrons and holes. So, in this case, as you see, that we are able to generate mobile electrons under. Uh, we are able to generate mobile electrons in certain portion of the semiconductor by applying voltage somewhere else. Okay, so that is the key here. We are able to generate electrons on, in the piece of the semiconductor by applying voltage somewhere else. We are able to generate these mobile electrons. Now, this control is fascinating because you say that I turn on the tap, mobile electrons get generated. I close the tap, they vanish. Right, I reduce the VGB. The concentration of the electrons go away. I increase the VGB, I get more and more concentration of electrons. And this is modeled, this is modeled as uh, the, the electron concentration or the total charge concentration under me here is modeled as let's say Q is equal to this capacitance. You have a capacitance obviously because you have a metal, you have oxide, metal insulator, and you have some. Uh, some concentration of electrons which have gotten generated, which are flush along along the surface, right? So you have C ox. Ox is basically uh, denoting the fact that there is an oxide times a voltage. What is this voltage? This voltage is equal to what is this voltage? VGB minus uh... VGB. It's supposed to be VGB. It looks like VGB because it looks like I have applied VGB after, between these two terminals. Right, it looks like a parallel plate capacitor. It looks like a parallel plate capacitor where we have applied VGB. Right, but it's not actually VGB because note that we we are initially we had to extend we had to, we expended some VGB in order to push in order to generate the diffusion medium. After that, the magic started to happen. After that, we were starting to get free electrons. So, which means that there is a certain amount of threshold voltage beyond which, before which you don't have any significant amount number of electrons. After that, you have some significant number of mobile electrons. So, that, that threshold voltage we denote as VTH. Okay. So, again, this is a model. You From this model, it, you should not conclude that when VGB equal to VTH, Actually, there is no mobile electrons. There are, there are always mobile electrons. 
but whether it's significant for us or not, that's a different issue. So at circuit designers, what we say is that this is not significant when VTB is, is less than VTH, it's significant when VTB is more than VTH. So we'll use this as our model to develop our uh, current voltage equations of the system. Okay, so the key thing to take away from today's lecture is the fact that we have a device, we have a device who, which can give us controllable electron density, controllable uh, uh, free, free, free electron density, so which can be controlled by using a separate voltage source. Okay, so this control is something that is extremely important when you are doing any design. It will we will harp back to this multiple times. Uh, and in in uh, from the next class, which will be on Wednesday, we'll take it from here. Okay. But, yes. Uh, you know, we told about 